That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Imaginary, the eighth film directed by Jeff Wadlow, which Lionsgate is releasing March 8th, 2024. Do I know a Jeff Wadlow film? Yes, I think we've talked about his last two oh. films in some capacity, both of which I vehemently disliked, uh, including The Curse of Bridge Hollow oh. uh, and Fantasy Island. Oh, uh, yeah. He might be better revered for earlier titles, Truth or Dare, or even Cry Wolf, but... Mm. What is Imaginary about? A woman returns to her childhood home to discover that the imaginary friend she left behind is very real and unhappy that she abandoned him. What is your pull quote? Ironically, any actual exploration of imagination and ultimately infantile imaginary has been sterilized with secondhand ideas and schlocky characterizations. Oof. Mine. If the Wayans made a parody of an insidious poltergeist mashup and forgot to include the jokes. That would be imaginary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is a no. Yeah. I feel like I wasted my time watching this movie. Because <laughs> we did. There are some fun things to it, which we'll talk about. But like the first hour, by the time we get to them, I was annoyed. Yeah, I know. Every now and then I'm like, oh, this is better than at least the last couple of things this director has done. But uh, And then they just get dashed to bits, those, those brief moments of hope. Yeah. Okay, so the woman, her name is Jessica, played by... Dewanda Wise, who stole all her scenes in Jurassic World Dominion. That's right. She also was one of the poor women that was supposedly obsessed with Kevin Hart in the film Fatherhood. So Jessica's married to this guy, Max, this British guy, and he has two children, Alice and Ty Taylor. Taylor. And we see that they are going to be moving into Jessica's childhood home. Mm -hmm. Because her dad, who was living there, is having some psychiatric issues and has moved to a nursing home. So they get to the house and immediately the younger daughter, Alice, finds a teddy bear in the basement. And the teddy bear's name is Chauncey. Mm -hmm. And she talks to Chauncey like it's her imaginary friend. The premise, like on IMDb, kind of ruins the film because we don't realize that that bear is Jessica's childhood imaginary friend until like the middle of the film. Mm -hmm. But that's what it is. And Chauncey's making Jessica do things. Like he's made her create this checklist, like a scavenger hunt. But it's all to test her, to push her into moving into his world. So like she has to find things that make her happy, find do something that'll get her in trouble, do something that will cause her pain. And once she achieves all those things, a door will open. And it does. And Alice goes missing. But we learn from a neighbor played by Betty Buckley. <laughs> yes, the wonderful Betty Buckley. Who yes. people would know from. The film Carrie, M. Night Shyamalan has used her recently in films like Split and The Happening. So, Betty Buckley's character used to babysit Jessica when she was a little girl. But we learn in the beginning of the film that Jessica was taken away from her dad and lived with her grandmother. Mm -hmm. We don't know where the, her mother is, do we? Not in the picture. Yeah. There's some murky, dare I say it, convoluted uh, details were given about her background as a child. But... We come to find that Jessica was removed from the home as a little child because it would appear that her dad, like, abused her. Because Jessica has, like, a big scar on her arm. Mm -hmm. But Betty Buckley says, no, nah, girl, when you were, like, five, you also had this imaginary friend, Chauncey. And he made you do all the same crazy shit. And one night while I was babysitting you... I saw your ass walk through an imaginary door into another world. She's very much like the Barbara Hershey character. In, in Insidious. In Insidious, yeah. And then we find out that Betty Buckley has spent the, 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 the proceeding 30 years since Jessica left, like, becoming a scholar on imaginary friends. Mm -hmm. So she's written a book about it. So she knows all about everything. Across cultures. It's like she walked off the set of Polanski's Frantic and just did this. And she says, oh, we have to do that, complete that checklist so we can open the portal and go find Alice. They successfully do that. They go into this, it really felt like the further, like from Insidious. As designed by M.C. Escher. And, sure. And, uh, but then we find out Betty Buckley kind of tricked them because she says, oh, Chauncey convinced me to fool you all into coming here because he wants, he wants Jessica. He misses her. So this was all a ruse to get Jessica back. Because her imagination is so powerful. So the final 20 minutes is them running around the further, 
trying to get Alice. There's a false ending where we think they've escaped, but they haven't. No. And then they replicate that again. Yeah. They are successful in getting out and they close the portal by painting it shut, not unlike Insidious the Red Door. Mm -hmm. Except this is a blue one. <laughs> Except it's blue. And then they burn the spirit. And then the final scene is the three... And, they, and by doing that, I'll burn the house down. And they burn the house down. Betty Buckley dies within the further. And then the and then, three of them, with their house burned down, try to check into a hotel. Yeah, that's, that, that's basically it. Man. Uh. <laughs> you know, so DeWanda Wise was an executive producer on this. Sorry, girl. There are moments when I thought, oh, this could be fun. And I have a couple thoughts on what I thought would have been a better movie, but this was not it. Mm -hmm. That she is doing the most she can with this script from Greg Erb and Jason Oramland, who wrote The Princess and the Frog. Uh, but it's uh, real corny. It's, it's really corny. This feels like a darker YA Disney film that would have been made in the 70s. Yeah, actually. And in fact, there's a much better, very similar film from 2009 directed by Joe Dante called The Hole. Oh, <laughs> I'm just going to go through my notes. The actor playing Max. Um, uh, Tom Payne. I thought he was handsome. He looked like he could be Harry Styles' brother. But yeah. I wrote down that he wears a lot of jewelry. Because there's a scene where he is at home with Jessica before he leaves, which we'll get to. And he's in the bathroom, like, getting ready for bed. And he's wearing, like, so many bracelets and then takes off a necklace. Mm -hmm. That seemed odd. Like, an odd... Well, he's, like, alternative because he then uh, immediately disappears to go on tour. Well, we'll, we'll get to that. Um... So we just made fun of, or we just reviewed and I guess made fun of that movie Damsel with... Mm -hmm. Angela Bassett playing the stepmother to two little white girls that she's obsessed with. Mm -hmm. And then now we're watching another movie where there's this black stepmama who's like, ride or die for these badass stepkids. I don't, I don't know what... I hope this is not a new trope. I hope because not Because I'm not feeling it. Because she seems about as in love with them as she does with the husband. And, well, I don't know. These movies also, because the kids are bad, it's like... Makes you not want to be a step parent or a, or a parent. The bear's name is Chauncey, and whenever I hear the name Chauncey, I think of the R and B group Blackstreet. So I just have to say that. Um, okay, so Max's ex wife is out of the picture because am, am I incorrect in thinking that the the mom had like psychological problems? Uh huh. Yep. And escaped from somewhere and has been texting with the teenage daughter and makes a surprise appearance for a red herring. Mm -hmm. Right. And then immediately after that happens, like, and the police show up and because the stepmom has to be removed, like, with an ambulance because mm -hmm. she's had a fit. What does the dad do? He goes on tour, like you said, and he tells the family, I can still bail on this tour. What? <laughs> she said, And she says no. And then he says, you're helping them find their happiness again. What the are you doing? What yeah, are you doing? What's Kelly? happening right now? Ugh. We got to talk about Jessica's wardrobe because the actor, Demanda, is stunning, beautiful. Mm -hmm. But they have her wearing all these really tight, like spaghetti strap top. They're all sleeveless. They're all very form fitting, mm -hmm. and then lots of billowy bottoms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Like almost harem pant style things sometimes. Yeah. Every outfit, with the exception of like. There's one time when I think she's in bed and she's wearing like boy shorts. And then one time she's wearing like a flannel over the sleeveless shirt that she then takes off. That was a weird choice. Interesting. Combined with a very specific hairdo. Mm -hmm. So she is a children's book author. That's right. She has a, a main character called Molly the Millipede whose antagonist is some kind of spider. The film opens with her having a nightmare with a spider that I was... Includes her dad, that, yeah. That I thought was initially promising because it's kind of Lovecraftian with mm -hmm. this tentacle thing like in the mouth of madness. That energy ends real soon though. Um, but, but I found it interesting that she's constantly drawing spiders but then also having repetitive uh, nightmares about them. Right. Uh, but yeah, Betty Buckby tells her like after you were gone, your dad would sit on the porch and he just was obsessed with your books. And he, he would devour them. They're children's books. They're children's they're books. Chil they're like picture books. They <laughs> are picture books. This, this man. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so I couldn't stand that older daughter. She kind of remind me, re reminded me of Xantippe from... The Kimmy Schmidt series. Yes, mm -hmm. but I kind of like that character. This girl, Taylor, I couldn't stand. They're using her as comic relief in a lot of ways, though, that <sighs> don't work. But anyway, there's this neighbor boy named Liam, who's, I think, an older teenage boy. I thought he was written so corny. And at one point, 
Jessica asks Taylor, can you watch your sister have something to do, which is go visit her dad in the nursing home. And what does this Taylor do? Immediately call or text the boy, the, the neighbor Liam to come over. Mm -hmm. And this boy is a creep. Immediately, yeah. he's like, want to do some Molly? He has like a bag. That little Ziploc bag and like... And then she's like, no. He's like, well, if you're not going to do that, then well, let's drink. And she's like, no, my dad, will, I'll be in so much trouble. Don't go through his alcohol. And this little stupid boy like breaks like a vodka bottle. Immediately. And, immediately. And she's like, ah, go upstairs and grab towels. Like, well, how would he know where the towels are? And then when he goes up there, he... Uh, Takes his sweet time and goes pee. He pees and then he gets startled because the bear is kind of following him. And then he pees all over the floor and on his hands. And that little dirty boy wiped his pissy hands on these people's towel. Mm -hmm. Didn't even wash his hands. Yeah. Didn't clean up the pee on the floor. And then the Chauncey scares him. That scene is, is one of the, was one of those small glints. Because yes. Chauncey's on the, on the floor in the hallway covered with a, a blanket or a towel or something. And there's this creepy, it's inching towards him. And then it does this thing where it turns into like a, a, big, a big grizzly bear. Yeah. Uh, that scene reminded me of Mario Bava's shock. Who it was his last film? That that very famous scene where that little boy becomes a man, all in the space of one scene. The way it's edited looks amazing. Um, again, the few and far between those glints of like, oh, that's interesting. Now, also, we learn at the halfway point that, well, I'll get to it in a second. So after the incident with Liam, then. Jessica discovers that one of her paintings was destroyed and she's like, oh, I bet Alice did it because she's acting out. Mm -hmm. So then we get this monologue from Jessica to little Alice while Alice is in bed telling her like, I understand why you did this when I was a little girl. Like it's kind of a long little talk. And then at the end she goes, ooh, honey, the way I love you both. And then realizes that Alice is not in the bed. She's like outside in the backyard. Tearing apart the fence. So she was talking to Chauncey underneath the covers. And we we see some movement. We too. see movement. It, it could have been creepy. I think the tone was what, real off. And then hearing this actor say, ooh, honey, the ooh. way I love you both, felt so fake. How about these little girls that aren't very friendly to her? Ugh. So the reason Alice was outside and not in bed is because part of her checklist Chauncey gave her is to hurt herself. Mm-hmm. And so she's going to do that by like jamming her hand into like a rusty nail. But Jessica's able to kind of stop her in the nick of time before she, she still hurts herself, but not too badly. And that's when Jessica calls the therapist who we're made to think <clears throat> has already seen. Yes, she Alice, has, she has, but we don't know why, but well, Alice has burns on her arms. And I think we're hinted at something happened with the bio mom. Which felt real like, But again, okay. it seems too convoluted. Yes. It's not made very clear like what exactly happened to this little girl. But this therapist, that scene I thought was humorous because the therapist is videotaping Alice. And Alice starts talking to her imaginary friend. And it's not until after this scene. Because the, the therapist is recording her. And then Jessica, after the session, Jessica goes, well, where's the bear? And the therapist is like, what bear? Dr. Soto. Mm -hmm. She's like, the bear that she brought in here. There ain't no bear in this room. And then we look at the video and realize that only Alice and Jessica are seeing this bear. No one else is seeing it. I did think that was a creepy moment. But then I thought the therapist kind of ruined it. Because the way she's talking to Alice makes it seem like she doesn't deal with children often. <laughs> Uh -huh. And then the way... She's like, pause. Let's stop and process let's this. Pro like the, like to, the language she's using is like, you don't work with kids. This little girl is accelerating emotionally very quickly. There's no pausing that. Then I think the little girl actor did a fine job with what she was given. Piper Braun. I think the dialogue is so corny. It's corny and the, the tonal shifts are, are nonsensical. Jarring. Like like one minute she's like, I want to be in the imaginary world. And she's like, I'm done here. I want to go home. Yeah. Ugh. So uh, then the, yeah. the therapist is played by Veronica, Fal Veronica Falcone, who's a very notable Mexican actress. She was in uh, Ozark. Oh, Alice is talking to her imaginary friend Chauncey and she's doing its voice. Mm -hmm. But the way it's filmed, it's I guess we're supposed to think that the voice sounds like it's not coming from mm -hmm. Alice. So then after the session's done and after all that, the therapist asked Jessica, 
Has Alice taken up any new hobbies like ventriloquism? What? <laughs> because the little girl finally turns and Chauncey's voice continues. Yeah. And that's when we see... Then the therapist is like, I need to talk to you, Jessica. She's like, I've dealt with some other kids and they said something that Alice said that really made me think. Alice said never ever. She opens up her laptop, the therapist, and plays her Pulls video. up a video of another patient to show Jessica. And immediately I wrote HIPAA violation. HIPAA violation. Why are you showing this person another but patient's like, oh, video? But this little boy disappeared a week after this. Oh. And it's like, does that mean it's okay to show this? And but yeah, that's the trigger word. Never ever. Never is, ever. Is never ever unique well, enough? In, the, the, in Peter Pan's world, like never never land. I, I feel like they needed to call the further or like never ever needed to have a more unique name so that it would make sense that this therapist remembered never ever never ever was the trigger word okay uh then she's talking about parakism paracosm or which i had to look it up because with her accent it yeah. i wasn't quite sure what she was saying but i gathered that she was referring to paracosm which is the concept of like imaginary worlds mm -hmm. but i just i thought it was funny that she kept saying it as if jessica knows what that means like okay can, can you please explain what this word means mm -hmm. so then after she realizes that like like what happened after the therapy session then we hear jessica go that's it i gotta destroy this bear okay uh, but we okay and then we get a montage because when we first go to the new house Jessica goes into the basement and finds some of her old, like, uh, artwork. Mm -hmm. And we see that she has drawn, because the box says Jessica age five, and we see that she drew something called Never Ever. Yeah, and, so a, like, and a door. And, and a, a door. Wall. And there's like a little bear painted on the bottom. He's, he's in, where's Waldo and all her old yes. uh, pictures? And then we get a montage where we see her flipping through her old artwork, literally like where's Waldo, finding the bear. And it be increasingly becomes more ridiculous. <laughs> My favorite was the little girl whose, With the eyes. whose eyes are the bear. Yeah, that was laughable. <laughs> that was laughable. Yeah, pretty dumb. Mm -hmm. Then Taylor starts screaming at Jessica like, you're crazy. You're crazy. Like, you're, your craziness is rubbing off on my sister. And then I thought, isn't your mama crazy? Your, your biological mom is literally yes. like in a psychiatric but facility. But at the point where Taylor is getting up in Jessica's face, they are outside wandering around looking for Alice who has disappeared. And they're like, the cops are looking for her. But this... In this sleepy neighborhood, no one seems to care this, that a child is missing. missing. There were so many moments where if I were that mom, I would have got that little teenage girl together. Oh, if you were Jessica? Not your crazy ass mama and you want to get at me about like you don't like me as your stepmom. I think and your mom is a mental it, case. It's just no. annoying seeing her have to be so saintly. And, and that also doesn't allow us to build any kind of emotional... A connection with any of these characters because nobody's acting realistically no so when betty buckley tells jessica you need to go into the further you need to replicate this checklist and they do there's like a little montage they grab all this stuff something that makes you happy something she, that she cuts out a piece of her wig yeah and then she goes well pain and then the scene where jessica causes pain and she stabs herself with scissors that felt so jarring and then we realized that that pain wasn't enough like I guess Chauncey needed something more painful. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, I don't know where this came from, Jessica starts dragging Taylor. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Talking about how you ain't shit, you're the reason that your sister's in here because you were supposed to watch her, and then that was more painful. I thought that was so... I mean, that should have been in like a comedy. Also arbitrary. Also felt very arbitrary. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... <laughs> I don't have a couple more notes. Why did they make Jessica's dad look so damn crazy? I don't think that man needs to look that crazy. Because I think they were trying, because we see him in flashbacks, so I think they were trying to make it. But it looks like he's has glaucoma because he had well, looked looked at Chauncey in the eyes when he was You're right. I, I, I think they cast someone who was probably like, I think that actor's probably my age, and they try to make him look even older. Uh -huh, so he looks crazy. And then we see that in his attempt to close the door to the further, when his daughter Jessica was five, we're told that he witnessed all of these kids like fears and that's what drove him crazy and that's what gave him like uh, cataracts. And then the thing that he had to do to open the portal, like cause pain to himself, was he had to pull a tooth out uh -huh. and he pulled his front tooth out. So now we have this dusty man with wide like fish eyes and a missing front tooth. <laughs> 
But uh, so then he w was he crazy? I thought he was devouring his daughter's books on the porch for years. Well, that part. Well, maybe right. he was crazy, and that's why the picture books really got him. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It just starts thinking. Then the way they're able to get out of the further is just <sighs> like Jessica out of her ass pulls this idea of like, well, we're in the wherever, so you can use your imagination. So she starts constructing something on the door that in, or on the wall to look like a door, which immediately looked like La La Ree's bag dress. Ooh, yeah. Just, <laughs> like, just, taping, just slap any tape. Taping shit on top of shit. Uh, but then she, and she's like, uh, destruction is also creation. <laughs> okay. That was terrible. <laughs> sure. Then as they're trying to get out the door, but the demon is pulling him in, the demon is doing something with its eyes, the same that it did with the dad. So now Jessica and it's very Taylor. It's a very dark crystal. Yes. They're being captivated and it looks like their eyes are going to turn white. And it takes forever for Alice, the little girl, to do something. And she goes, fire magic. Because earlier in the film, she was too afraid to light matches. Mm -hmm. So this, and we see that somehow gasoline fell onto, because they're in the basement, gasoline fell onto the monster. So then we see Alice light a match and ignite the monster and the house. And like you already said, the fire truck gets there so fast. It is. Like, like, is the fire department next door? <laughs> but that house might have been made of paper because it was the. It just started, they just got outside, and all of a sudden the roof is collapsing. Like, like yeah. And man, then the fire truck's right there. It's like, right there. What what neighborhood is this? And then they're just at the hotel. Like, is like who's paying for this? You don't what? Like, and she, they're wrapped in blankets. <laughs> Jessica is still wearing the same dress, and she's injured her ankle in the. Because she broke her ankle. And she's on crutches, and the three of them stumble into this hotel and witness another little boy talking to his imaginary friend. And they're like, we got to go to the next hotel. But uh... Okay, so I think there are two directions this could have gone. If this movie wanted to be serious, I feel like it should have focused on Jessica and her the relationship with her father, how she ended up leaving. Because Jessica tells us right away that she doesn't remember the period... Whatever happened that caused her to leave her dad, she doesn't remember. She even makes the point, the character makes a point to say, all I have are happy memories mm -hmm. of my childhood. I had no imaginary friends. So I feel like if we wanted to go serious, we should have focused more on that and like filling in that gap and her finding out things and, you know, being tormented by this thing. I didn't need this little step family. And if they wanted to go more funny, because I do feel like the script is trying to be funny. Mm hmm I really do think a Wayans version of something where it's like this black stepmama dealing with these two little residious white girls. I want to see that version. Yes, yeah. who are like like involved in this imaginary demon and how she handles it. Like it needed mm -hmm. to go either way, but mm -hmm. it's in the this weird middle that's not that, funny. That not... earnestness that's just, this yeah. is so fake. Like you're not going to scream at these kids? What would you give imaginary? A one and a half. <sighs> I... It was hard to sit through, yeah. and I do feel like I kind of wasted my time. It's still better than Fantasy Island. <laughs> it is. That movie was horrible. Mm -hmm. I think I would give it two out of five. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? No. Join us on Patreon and listen to our podcast. Bye. <laughs>